morning once again. It's good to be with you. I so enjoyed Michael's sermon uh, last week. Looking forward to next week's sermon as well. Uh, I have a few more times with you, and so this week uh, we uh, are just been so blessed as a family to be worshiping uh, with this church over the last uh, several months, and uh, I enjoy being able to be with you again this morning to talk about uh, the Nativity story, the story of the birth of Christ from uh, Luke chapter 2 is where we're at, so if you have your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in the majority of that chapter as we look at the birth of Christ. Uh, but uh, as I said, this story is traditionally known as the, the story of the Nativity, the story of the birth of Christ. And uh, one of the things that we love as uh, a family, and I would say probably more so my wife loves the most, is setting up the Christmas decorations. Uh, she loves getting it out. She loves, and she's so good at it because she like wants everything to just look so perfect. I'm just like the shotgun approach, like let's throw up decorations and call it good. Uh, but she is just getting it so precise and it looks so good as, as she decorates our house. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy doing every year is setting up our nativity scene. Uh, my grandmother gave me, uh, or I got my grandmother's uh, nativity scene when she passed away, and so we had, it's a place of prominence. It's kind of a larger nativity scene. Uh, all of the figurines look Scandinavian, so it's not really culturally accurate, but it's a beautiful nativity scene nonetheless. And so uh, we has a place of prominence. In fact, in our house, we have several. Over the years, we've had several nativity scenes. Uh, I have one that my dad gave me when he went to Peru. Uh, I have a nativity scene from Ethiopia. Uh, we have one from Israel. Uh, we have other nativity scenes. We have our little people nativity scene, which doesn't really get set up anymore because our little people aren't little people anymore. Uh, so that one's in the garage, but we have it. We have one in the front yard, which I have not set up yet outside. Uh, but it's a big, large one that we put a spotlight on. Uh, one of the, the key parts of our Christmas is setting up the nativity scene because it's the importance of emphasizing the birth of Christ. You know, we have some Santas in our house too, but always there's got to be more Jesus in our house than Santa. Um, and it's to call our attention to this extraordinary moment in history when God became man. And it's remarkable to me as we will read through uh, Luke chapter 2, as we look at this extraordinary event in all of human history, that's a factual historical event, the birth of Jesus Christ, who became the Savior of the world, who came in such radically ordinary circumstances. If we really look at Luke chapter 2, the thing that should strike us uh, first and foremost is how magnificent his birth is and that God became flesh. But yet at the same time, we should also make known of how ordinary these circumstances really were that surrounded his birth. So let's begin by reading the first five, chap five verses of Luke chapter 2 as we look at the nativity of Christ. It says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Let's pray as we begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray that you would just open the eyes of our heart this morning, that we would uh, see an aspect of Christ that maybe we have never seen before, that we would be struck by this story in a new way, that you would cause us, like you caused Mary, to treasure up these things in our heart when we think about them. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just be with this sermon in all aspects, Lord, and, and may you draw those who need to be encouraged this morning. May you bring them encouragement, and I pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. 
Well, the fact that this story starts out something so very ordinary, it starts out with a government census. It says that uh, there was a decree by Caesar Augustus that all people should be registered, and so all people had to return to their own town. And you have to ask yourself, well, why was they doing a census? Why were they registering? Why would you have to return to your own town? And it's a simple fact. Some things don't change. The reason why Caesar Augustus wanted to register all people and they had to return to their own town is he wanted to make sure who was in his kingdom so that he could tax the right amount of people. Uh, This whole motivation and the reason why uh, Joseph and Mary moved, left from Nazareth and went down to Bethlehem is so that Caesar Augustus would get his fair share of taxes from his people. And so they went from a long journey. It says they went from the town of Nazareth, which is up by Galilee. And if you have that picture in your mind of the, the map that's in the back of your Bible of Galilee, which is the Sea of Galilee, which is up high. And then there's the Jordan River that rides, winds down. And then there's the larger Dead Sea at the bottom. Nazareth is right up by the Sea of Galilee. And they traveled 80 miles down and then up towards Bethlehem, which is at the top of the Dead Sea down by the Jordan River. 80 miles they traveled so that they could then fulfill the prophecy, which is in Micah 5.2, which says, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from the ancient of days. There was a prophecy in these ordinary circumstances that God used because Caesar Augustus wanted to tax his people. He used to fulfill the biblical prophecy of Christ's birth. Ordinary circumstances led to the extraordinary event of the birth of Jesus Christ. We call this the nativity story in theological terms. We call this the incarnation. And so that's what I'm going to emphasize is the the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation basically means to define that means uh, in the flesh. The act of God the Son in which he takes on human nature, in which God, who is all uh, eternal, becomes man through the person of Jesus Christ. And so through this story in Luke chapter 2, I want us to see four aspects of the incarnation. Four aspects of uh, God becoming flesh. It says this, uh, our first point this morning is, The incarnation provides a beautiful picture of God's desire for a restored relationship with mankind. Our first point, the incarnation provides a beautiful picture of God's desire for a restored relationship. With mankind. Look at verses 6 and 7. It says this And while they were there, the time had come for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So here we see the well-traveled couple, exhausted, tired, come to their destination. And just as they come to their destination, they come in time for the birth of Jesus Christ. The primitive accommodations provide the young couple the almost a startling simplicity of their measly surroundings in which they are there. Says that he is wrapped in swaddling clothes, uh, scraps of cloth in which he is wrapped in, and then he is laid in a manger, a, a feeding trough for animals. It says that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a feeding trough, uh, and he was there because there was no room for them in the inn, it says. That's what it says in my Bible. And there's a lot of ink that has been spilled on what exactly meant that there was no room for them in the inn. And we have all seen countless of depictions of this nativity story in movies, on television, and even in uh, those sometimes painful children's dramas. Uh, My kids were in some uh, Christmas dramas. My son, Ethan, played Joseph at one point, and my other son was an alligator. So there you go. That's how our family rolls. You didn't know one of the animals in the the barn was an alligator, but there you go. 
<laughs> We've all seen this depiction, right? And it's that scene in the movie, or there's this scene, which was definitely in the children's drama, of the grumpy innkeeper, right? So they come into Bethlehem, and they're knocking on doors, and they tell them to go away. And the grumpy innkeeper comes out and says, there's no room for you here. You have to leave. Right? And so they have to go, oh, you can go in my barn, he says. And so they go, and that's where Jesus is born. But in fact, the actual story is much different. Look in verses 6 and 7, and look for the innkeeper. There is no innkeeper. In fact, if you really want to make your head hurt, look for the donkey. There's no donkey either in this story. <laughs> Because in this time, it wasn't necessarily, and this is where you know, history can help us uh, give some insight into what we traditionally have. We have that traditional picture of the, the nativity scene that I talked about that is set up. But in actual fact, in this time in Bethlehem, and, and even in much of uh, these uh, Middle Eastern cities, is that you would keep animals in your home. In fact, you would actually live upstairs and you would keep uh, your livestock, or you would have a room in which you would bring some of your livestock, your sheep and goats and other things, inside underneath uh, where you would live in order to, one, to protect them from the cold, and their body warmth would help keep the rest of the house warm during winter. And it is said this word for inn could not just mean a hotel or an inn as we would traditionally think of, but the word inn there actually means upper room. In fact, in fact, in Luke 22, uh, verse 12, when Jesus, in his upper room discord, uh, discourse on the night he was betrayed, the same word for in in which uh, Jesus is with his disciples on the night he was betrayed is the same word that is used here. And so the picture that we have is Joseph is going to his hometown in which most likely he had some relatives in this town. There was family in this town. And so he's not going to look for Motel 6. He's going to look for his cousins, his uncles, his aunts, in which he could stay with, in which they are probably traveling to. And the upper room was probably already filled with family. And so they opened up the lower room in which they uh, could stay, in which was also used for animals at different times. Whatever it is, whether it is a barn outside or whether it is the lower room of a house, what Luke is emphasizing here is the ordinariness of the circumstances in which Jesus is born. Luke is emphasizing the truly meager and humble setting in which the king of kings is brought into this world. Jesus was not born in lavish surroundings. He was not born in a kingdom, uh, in, a, in a king's household. He was born into a very rural, average, ordinary, probably overlooked setting in which many people at the time could have probably had the same story. It was ordinary. But this somehow, this incarnation, the birth of Christ in this ordinariness paints for us a beautiful picture of God's desire for a restored relationship with mankind. He, he doesn't go to those lavish surroundings. He goes to where people are. The God of heaven came down not to those who were self-sufficient and affluent, but he came to those who had a sense of need, a sense of insufficiency. Just as it says in 2 Corinthians 2, 8-9, it says, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, may become rich. Jesus became poor, became an ordinary man, so that we, through faith in him, could become spiritually rich rich. The incarnation paints for us a beautiful picture of God's desire for a restored relationship with all men. The second thing and aspect of the incarnation is that the incarnation demonstrates God's perfect humanity. 
The incarnate demonstrates Christ's perfect humanity. Look again at verse 7. It says, She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I think it should be emphasized here that the birth of Christ becomes, that he becomes fully human in every respect except he was without sin. Jesus didn't just appear as a man. Jesus didn't appear as, uh, 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 in a costume of humanity. He didn't just have human appearance and characteristics. Jesus was human in every respect. He was completely and totally 100% human. There was a time where he had to be taught and things he didn't know. Jesus had to crawl before he learned how to walk. He thought and talked like a baby before he thought and talked like a man. Jesus had growing pains. He was similar to us in every respect, it says, except he was without sin. And yet at the same time, Jesus was 100% man, 100% human. He still held on to all his divine characteristics. At the same time, in the person of Jesus Christ, he was 100% God as well. He just submitted the exercise of those gifts to God the Father. Why is this so significant? Why is it significant that Jesus become 100% human? Hebrews gives us great insight. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says, for we do not have a high priest, meaning Christ, who is the high priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Christ is able to sympathize with our weakness of being human. But one who in every respect was tempted as we are, and yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus, as perfect humanity, like us in every respect, was without sin so that he could become the perfect substitute, the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Jesus became 100% human so that it could be the perfect sacrifice for sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 also says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The incarnation gives us a wonderful example of the humanity of Christ and the ultimate sacrifice for sin that he would become. The third aspect of the incarnation is this. The incarnation provides the ideal Savior who brings peace between God and man. The incarnation provides the ideal Savior who brings peace between God and man. Look at the story of the shepherds. I love this story. Luke 8 through 14. 2, 8 through 14. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that, that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. Luke surprises again as he reveals those who are chosen to hear the glorious news that God had become flesh, that Christ, the Messiah, was born. Who do you, does he reveal? Who does the angel reveal this message to? Is it those who are devoutly religious? No. Is it those who are rulers and in places of position and authority? No. 
It is those of, of good, high social standing and influence in their society. No, it is lowly group of shepherds. The average Joes, you could say, of the ancient world were shepherds. E even today, as you go to Jerusalem uh, and you go outside of Jerusalem walls and you go down to another city and you're going down from Jerusalem into other parts of the region, shepherds still uh, spot the land. They're still all over. Even in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was filled with shepherds. And he appears to shepherds. And I think it's an interesting note. Uh, when uh, A few years ago, my wife and I had a chance to travel to Jerusalem and Israel and go to Bethlehem. And they said that during this time, Bethlehem, which is just probably five miles, less than five miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is up on a hill. You kind of come down and come back up again to a smaller hill where Bethlehem is. And, and Bethlehem was known for its shepherds. Why were there so many shepherds in Bethlehem? In fact, they, they mentioned to us, I forget the exact number, but at that time there would have been shepherds all over the hillside because each year Israel would have to go travel from wherever they lived to Jerusalem to make atonement for the sin in which they would sacrifice an unblemished lamb. When we were there in Jerusalem, I, I thought it was interesting. It's kind of gruesome thought, but there was a place they showed us where it looked like there would be where water would flow out of the temple of Jerusalem. And, and it looked like there was this kind of gully and it looked like, well, this is probably where they get water or something. And they said, no, this is where the blood would flow from all of the sacrifices out of the temple and out of Jerusalem city. So you can imagine how many sheep filled this land. And shepherds were ordinary people. And yet they were preparing for the atonement of the lamb. Their job was so necessary and so symbolic to what God was going to do. And it is to them that the angel appears and says, Fear not, for I bring you good news for all people. God chooses shepherds because this is a message not just for the elite, but for all people. God desires to speak to every person about the coming of Jesus. The angel declares that he is the Savior, the one who will save man from their sin. The angel declares that he is the Christ that he is the anointed one, the one that is promised from the Old Testament, the one that will, will come and redeem and save Israel and ultimately all people. He is the Lord, which points to the authority and the lordship of Christ. And if one angel isn't enough, the heavens then are filled with a multitude. A multitude is not just 50, it's not just 150, it's not just 500, but an angel uh, that appears in a multitude is more angels than could possibly be counted. And they all declare, they don't necessarily sing, but they all declare glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Glory should be given to God because through this little infant, there will be peace between God and man. As we saw in Colossians chapter 1, 19 through 20, as Paul declared in his book, For in him all the fullness, in Christ that is, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, that through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. The purpose that this baby was born in Bethlehem, the purpose that this baby was born in a manger in this small town was so that God could make peace. That God could make peace between God the Father and all of humanity. And it says, peace for those whom he is pleased. God, that is. This peace will be brought by Jesus is not automatic for everyone. This peace that was brought were those whom God is pleased. Only those who respond to God's call and walk according to his ways will find this peace. Jesus comes for all, but not all respond. I love this picture of the incarnation is one in which Jesus has come to make peace before God and man. Fourthly and finally, the incarnation provokes a response 
of both obedience and praise. The incarnation, the birth of Christ, provokes a response of both obedience and praise. Look with me again in verses 15 and following. It says, And when the angels went away, they just went away somewhere, disappeared uh, from into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Well, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And they saw it. And they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Look at how the shepherds respond to this news. Immediately, they go and search for this baby that is wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. They, they respond with obedience. And once they find this baby lying in a manger, they are provoked with a response of praise. It says they are filled with praise. And it says they can't even keep this message to themselves. After they see the baby and they tell Mary and Joseph all that the angels had told them, they leave there telling everyone that they meet of the marvelous story of what just happened to him and the baby that had born in Bethlehem. They respond with praise and obedience. And look at Mary. I love Mary's response. It says, Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. You often wonder all the things that Mary was pondering in her heart. Uh, the moment that the angel appeared to her and said that you are going to be with child. And nine months later, it came true. Pondering Joseph's faithfulness after probably fearing that he would divorce her, and now he remains faithful to her in the midst of this unexpected pregnancy. The story of her cousin Elizabeth as she goes into the temple, Elizabeth, who is also pregnant with John the Baptist, and, and the, the, John the Baptist leaps in his womb, in her womb, at the, the, the presence of the Messiah that is in Mary. And now these shepherds who come worshiping, bowing down before her just-born child. She could not just hold it in, but she, she pondered all of these things. She praised the Lord in all those things. And then she obeys the Lord. Look in verse 21. It says, And at the end of the eight days, when, she had, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. She obeys. She names him the name that the angel told, him, told her to name him. Name him Jesus. She responds with both praise and obedience. Let us all be reminded this Christmas season that as we encounter Jesus, even as a baby, that this should prompt both a response of praise and and obedience. One of the things that we love to do also as a family is not just decorate, but listen to Christmas music. Although as my kids are becoming teenagers, they, they like it less and less. Uh, we've said it as a rule that we won't listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving uh, because we want to fully enjoy Thanksgiving. But one of the things that we do when we're in the car together is listen to Christmas music. And even today, I was, I was struck by the the, the, the songs that they sometimes play on Christmas, or Christian or on secular uh, radio stations. I heard this morning, um, What Child Is This? I think it was sung by one of the country singers. But What Child Was This Played? And just declared all over on secular radio to millions of people as this time of year where the, the birth of Christ is just kind of wrung out. Uh, it was the song right before that was Santa Baby. So we went from Santa Baby... <laughs> Right to what child is this? Uh, but I was struck by the fact, why is it still that even on secular radio, we hear these songs about the birth of Jesus? You think that they would be banned for sure. And I think one of the aspects of this is, is that people in our culture, in ours particular, who has a Judeo-Christian background, 
loves the warm feelings that the birth narrative gives us. The story of a young couple defying all of the odds beat, uh, that was going against them and makes it to this town and has to go into a, a barn with animals to have her baby be born. And this was the baby that was then going to save the world. We like the warm feelings that that gives us. And yet at the same time, we can embrace the warm feelings as a culture and miss that this is the baby who came to make peace, who demands not just our warm feelings, but demands our praise and demands our obedience to him. So this morning, I want us all Christmas season to ponder these things in our hearts, to take Time in the midst of this busy, crazy season that we have over the next two weeks of, of, of Christmas parties and buying Christmas gifts, to take time like Mary did and to ponder and treasure these things in our heart, to reflect on this person of Jesus Christ who came to make peace by his blood, by dying on the cross for our sin. And also there are those this morning who may like those warm feelings that the Christmas season gives us, but has never trusted in Christ as their Savior and Lord. May this season be for you, be marked by a different Christmas season, filled not just with warm feelings, but with praise and obedience as you submit your life to Christ and trust in Jesus Christ for your sin because he made payment on the cross and was the punishment that you and I both deserve so that we could have peace with God so that we could have relationship with him so that we could be saved and forgiven of all of our unrighteousness and made right before God once again let us treasure those things together let's pray gracious heavenly father Oh, how I love the birth story, the nativity story and scene. And Lord, I pray that you would just encourage us by your word this morning. May you encourage us as we ponder these things as Mary did in our hearts. And I pray that even in this Christmas season that you would bring about in us a response of praise and obedience. And that it's in his name I pray. Amen.